all ideas uh, start at some abstract, abstract point of view and then they become more concrete. And I think the same way really was with the European Union and European Monetary Union. Remember how European economic uh, community started really many, many years ago, just uh, reaching some agreements about the code uh, between uh, some countries and uh, how many countries are now in the European Union. And uh, remember how Euro started uh, not so long ago, uh, before that we had the European monetary system, the so-called snake in the tunnel, when uh, it was the idea how to have more stable currencies in European, in Europe, in order to, to promote trade, uh, you know, more export and import of services and similar. So that were all ideas which started quite, I would say, politically, and they were trying to, to, to make them more concrete later on and to introduce more rules and regulation later on. Uh, really, uh, unified Europe started as an idea and now we are still making rules and regulation about it. Look how, how Euro, uh, <clears throat> how many problems had Euro uh, from the start till, till up till now. Euro has still a lot of problems and the rules are being introduced uh, I would say all the time, new rules, new regulation. When Maastricht's agreement was signed, uh, there was no solution that certain country can also exit out of Europe. That solution was not foreseen at that time. Now maybe uh, we look differently at that. However, at that time, uh, uh, I'm sure that rule was necessary not to have exit because if that was the case, I think Europe would not be so uh, trustworthy just kicking it, kicking it uh, off, you know. So when, when constructing Euro as unique, uh, I would say, um, unique case in the history of finance, unique world case uh, of, of, of constructing new currency, uh, they set uh, five different Maastricht criteria. Three fiscal ones and, and, um, and uh, two monetary ones. Uh, we all know they are quite loose, they are not so strict and basically all countries uh, you know, are not following them anymore, especially the fiscal ones. And there are also some, some uh, penalties uh, you know, at that time uh, envisaged for this, for this project. However, these penalties haven't been uh, in use. So we have some problems here. We have the system who is not really working, nobody follows it anymore, nobody penalizes it, and uh, we have basically no exit possible. So, uh, and again, it's it's unique project, really unique project. I'm in great favor of it. So therefore, some problems came later on, and of course, European Union has to, European Monetary Union has to react on that. Uh, some stability mechanisms were introduced, EFSM, uh, later on, now ESM, uh, before it stood for European uh, uh, Monetary System, now it stood for European Monetary Stability. Uh, and um, European Banking Union, Union is being introduced with all the rules coming up with the single supervisory mechanism, so called SSM, uh, which is coming up and will take care and will supervise uh, 128 largest uh, European banks or and or systematic banks. So Slovenia will include three banks being directly uh, supervised by European Central Bank in Frankfurt. Uh, so all this is coming up and um, it, it's right to come. It should have been there in place already when Euro started coming. Um, and of course, when we talk about the future of Euro, I would say more fiscal unification is necessary, less fiscal uh, um, I mean more, more fiscal unification is necessary for sure. So how this will be reached it's, it's another question. If we had let's say European bond right now, meaning that let's say each country issuing uh, national government bonds, European Union would guarantee for them. I'm sure the prices of the bonds of many countries would be much lower. I mean, the yields lower. I'm quite sure about that. However, there are some countries which don't want to uh, guarantee for such, uh, such issues, which is, of course, understandable. But how can we you know, bridge that problem? Uh, these are all the issues uh, where politicians are trying to get some um, compromise. And uh, we know 
what kind of discussions are taking place, uh, what kind of problems are arising, and so on. And it's not easy to, to overcome all these problems. Unfortunately, I, I personally think that um, more regulation and unification is coming up, even maybe we don't like it so much on the personal level or even national level. And uh, that is kind of guarantee for a more efficient uh, European Union, if you want that one. If you want to have kind of loose uh, European Union, then probably some status quo would be, would be there and some politicians would be uh, you know, telling us about that. And since European elections are just coming up, I'm sure some, kind of, some uh, parties will also uh, try to advocate for that. So maybe that's for the start. The European Union has been mostly treated as a phenomenon of the economic sphere. However, many people would disagree and essentially argue it has been a political project and that economics has all the time played the second fiddle to the political process of integration despite the obviously economic terms of integrating, starting with the first proto-union, which was the um, coal uh, unions. There seems to be a lot of things going on. First, the idea that uh, you should tie the fiscal policy and the monetary policy, uh, which is something you know prevailing now. Uh, I'm not an expert, but we saw my words for the being that, but if I look at the US, uh, it seems to me that each state still has some kind of flexibility regarding fiscal policy. Uh, as well, you also have uh, some states that are kind of close to bankruptcy, <laughs> and um, although they, they do share the same, you know, the same uh, currency, uh, obviously. Now, in the EU, we don't have the same currency, and I think well, because some country, you know, UK, are obviously out of it. And on top of that, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, and that's my second point, and that having a common fiscal policy, you know, the kind of harmonization you, you referred to towards the end, uh, would be the best way to bring some fiscal orthodoxy in countries uh, such as France. And, you know, coming from France, um, and um, I, I do think that we need some fiscal autocracy, of course. I think this is, a, uh, this is part of uh, individual freedom. We need to be protected from, uh, from a state that will you know, uh, do all kinds of, I mean, use this power to tax, to, uh, you know, to go in any direction. Uh, I mean, at least to the next election. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think we should aim more at you know, what they call the fiscal laboratory. Uh, especially in, in the EU, where uh, definitely uh, you know you have different sensibility. I mean, whether you're in Spain, Portugal, Ireland, or Lithuania. Uh, so uh, my point is that uh, moving towards a more fiscal union would be a great mistake. And, and uh, uh, what we need is indeed some rules that will govern everyone, uh, but, but not going in that direction. That that will is almost sure to fail anyway. I think uh, now the first uh, sort of uh, question we threw at the table, which is, is the sort of currency area big enough? You know, do we need to constantly expand? I think, uh, as an economic union, it's, it's big enough. You know, it's it's you know, in terms of population, markets, you know, complexity, you know, it's like the biggest thing in the world almost. You know, um, so I think uh, the next focus should be. Uh, one of quality and structure, how to make it work better, basically. Because we discovered that there were some design failures, uh, which were sort of washed up with the crisis, and we need to think again how to make them work, you know, how to try and first integrate uh, things where a consensus exists, you know, because without a consensus, we might sort of talk for 30 years, you know, there's purely not a consensus for a fiscal union right now, and you won't get it, you know. If we had a vote today, probably, you know, we wouldn't have a positive then nobody vote. would vote for it, yeah. that's for sure. But what I think is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of confidence and trust uh, between all those who are members of the, of the integration, you know. Uh, I think that's been put to a test. And uh, the say, politicians, all the experts are now struggling to sort of find an interim regime to get back some trust and all these attempts with the banking union and more stricter regulation and 
you know, the, how to avoid bailouts. You know, simply, you know, one part of the European Union doesn't trust the other one. That's why the taxpayers don't want to put up their cash to bail out a bank in another country or potentially, I don't know, some other institution. Because the ECB doesn't have the balance sheet, essentially, as its own subject to be seen as a force in the market. It is only supported by the underlying central banks. And today even, you know, where, where's the distrust? Many people don't know. When Slovenian banks take on liquidity and pose collateral to the euro system, it comes from central banks that have surplus in liquidity. And essentially, surplus in liquidity, where do we find it? We find it, you know, the biggest pool is Germany. Why? Because certain institutions decide to park their cash with the Bundesbank, and the Bundesbank, if, if essentially has cash, needs to fork it over if you turn over collateral. So this is essentially, so I think that the ECB is not really a central bank. We need to fix that at some point. Countries need to decide that they want to stand behind the euro, and they need to commit more capital to the balance sheet of the ECB and make it stronger. But it will never happen <laughs> until uh, we have a consensus on the way the banking union should look like, well, how those rules will look like, and how we try and separate, essentially, the taxpayers' money from, I would say, you know, how should I say, hedging, you know, the, the too big to fail banking busts and everything in the, in the system. So, what I feel is that, first of all, we need to try and get some markets that function in the European Union, and the financial market is one of them. The other one is the I would say other sorts of liberties we have decided we would have and we don't have today, you know, such a labor market, you know, goods, everything. So, so this is a project which is sort of, sort of in progress. And to think that it has been done when some governments or you know, parliaments have ratified some agreements, it hasn't been done in practice. It will be a process where confidence should return only after you see that there, there's, I don't know, German investments going into yeah. Spain, uh, into Greece, into Slovenia, <laughs> because it makes sense to be there, and because you feel that you have a general framework and you sort of trust some, I would say, version 2.0 that has been sort of agreed to by all the members. You know? that's, that's why I think that's sort of where you need to start. And at the end, you might get fiscal union if everyone's excited. That's a very long road, I think. The question is, how should Europe nudge its way forward in this situation at the moment when each of the countries has a very heavily tainted banking system and also when most governments have been uh, infected by problems in the banking system to the extent we most clearly saw in 2010 in Ireland where the entire government finances collapsed having bailed out its banking system. And I really wonder if I could turn the question back again to, to the you know, speaker, Fresco. Do you really think that Greece joining the European Union and the EA 18 as it is now has been a good thing for the European project? <laughs> what I guess what the difficult questions. <laughs> uh, well, um, <laughs> well, obviously, I mean, uh, even the Greece didn't fulfill the requirements to enter the Euro, you know, that was found out later on. So, I mean, I think the Greece should not enter Europe at that time. It was the 12th country to join, 11 starting off with zero. So that's, that's number one, I mean. But number two, I mean, why, why uh, let's say, uh, maybe you mentioned before, and I mentioned Germany and Italy in the, in the times of the snake, or in the tunnel, right? I mean, the German economy was stronger, but not stronger but only by, by GDP in absolute terms, but also in productivity and everything. So that's why they are basically because behind the currency rates is productivity, basically. So if certain country is less productive than the other one, obviously uh, the, the currency would depreciate and the other one would appreciate. So that was the problem in the snake. You had countries with less productivity and the countries with higher productivity. So at that time, I think also UK was problematic a little bit. Professor uh, and, uh, Soros, Soros uh, became billionaire at that time, <laughs> right? Yeah.